and how much we've learned over the years of having this weekly group faith sharing and opening up to our faith and our journey and um, our lives of children, our grandchildren, so many things. And um, it's, it's something we didn't do as Catholics, but we do it now, and we love it. I would add also the total trust that we have in each other, that you can say almost anything, and people will receive it, and, and everybody grows from that openness. And I agree with Claire, it's not a skill we were born with, especially as good Catholics. Well, thank you, ladies. Excellent, excellent. I heard sharing and exchanging of ideas and trust, I love it, great. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Um, the, the very nature of what I do with the center involves lots of listening, and not just physically listening, but actively listening. Um, many of the women who come to our center really have no support system, so they really need someone to just come in and be able to listen, not think about what you're going to say in response, but just to listen so they can share their story. And then more personally, um, I was uh, blessed that my one of my daughters uh, came to me with an issue that she was really struggling with to the point of, I thought she was gonna have a breakdown because it was just so upsetting to her. Um, so I just momentarily took off my parent cap. You know, we all had that urge to just go in and fix the problem. Uh, I just sat down with her for a very long time and listened didn't say a word, which was very hard for me to do. Some of you who know me may know that I sort of want to give advice a little too readily. Anyway, but it was my daughter. She was in crisis, and I just almost pretended like I was listening to a young woman in crisis at the center. Um, I listened, and she just poured everything out. And then after that, I really didn't say much. I just let her know that I was here for her, and um, not just as a mom, but just you know as a guide if she needed it. And she told me later that she really appreciated the fact that I wasn't a preachy person. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so great examples. Uh, like I said, we're going to be modifying this program a little bit from, from its um, uh, regular outline. But Okay, so today we're going to talk about just some of that basic communication skills. As, as I said before, I'm, I'm a counselor. And... Um, I'm trained with certain types of skills. We're going to go over some of those skills today that I believe um, not, any, not only makes parents more effective communicators, but, but can make anybody, children, adolescents, better communicators. So we're just going to go over some of these skills. I think you'll find when we go over them that you'll probably be saying to yourself, hmm, I've been doing that the entire time. I know what that is. I just didn't have a name for it. So if that's the case, fantastic. Um, hopefully it reinforces you to continue doing what you're doing. It just puts a name or a, um, a title to it. So the way I kind of do my workshops is I have an open forum. I'll ask a bunch of questions. I encourage you to participate. Um, I hope that uh, as I'm talking, I see hands raised to ask me questions. We can ask questions at the end too, but if there's something that I say or something that's concerning or something that is interesting and you want to point it out, whatever, feel free to interrupt me, okay? So let's get started. Basic communication skills, listening. The first one, I heard listening back there, I heard listening up here, just listening, okay? So it's really capturing the essence of what your son or daughter, or in this case, the person with whom you're speaking is trying to say, their message, right? And the goal is to support or to convey understanding and encourage their self-expression, okay? So I'm gonna ask my teens, what are some ways that you can show that you're listening? I'm gonna pick, can I, am I allowed to pick on students? Absolutely. Okay, good, it's encouraged, good. As soon as I asked the question, this young lady here looked away and was like, don't call on me. So guess what I'm going to do? <laughs> I'm going to call on you. So what is one way, and if you are uncomfortable, you don't have to. But what is one way that you can show 
that someone that you're listening to them? Um, making eye contact with them while they're talking. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I want to go back to that. Well, but that is excellent. Wonderful. What else? You look bright and you look like you have a lot of ideas and information. Yeah? You can, um, like, say or, like, nod your head a lot and, like, say things. Be like, oh, yeah, like, mm-hmm, and, like, make comments. Like, not, not, like, as they're speaking, like, don't interrupt them. But, like, um, if you, like, as they're talking and they, like, pause for something, you can, like, make a comment or, like, relate it to something that, like, you've experienced, too. Then it shows that, like, they were paying attention and, like, very much so, like, listening to exactly what you were saying and thinking about it, too. Beautiful. Thank We're going to get into that, actually, some of those skills. Um, you don't want to come up here and do this with me, do you? Those were excellent. Pardon me? She doesn't want to show me up, and she probably would. Yes, yes, excellent. So I heard eye contact, um, kind of following along, nodding your head, not falling asleep, I'm thinking, would be a good idea not to do. Okay, good. Um, the uh-huhs, right? Um, we can always lean forward in our, in our chairs, too. Okay, so these are kind of basic, not interrupting what you said. Excellent ladies, by the way. Are you Trinity students? Yeah. Thought so. I thought so. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, just those basic kinds of not interrupting, okay? One thing that I wanted to come back to was eye contact, okay? Now, we're, this is geared towards talking with your parents or talking with your friends. Is, that consist, is eye contact consistent with everyone? Think about it. Anyone want to comment on that? Shaking heads, Vaughn, you want to comment on that? I'm recalling some training I had in pastoral counseling with the rabbi that um, Father Bender mentioned, Rabbi Edelstein, who was excellent. Um, sometimes men tend to communicate more without the eye contact. Um, sometimes the most intimate conversations you might have with your dad or um, you're kind of like facing the same direction. Like um, that's that's just the way some guys are. I don't know. I mean, that seems to be more common. Um, I remember growing up on camping trips and stuff, and you're in a tent with another guy, and you're like you're looking up and you're kind of talking to each other, but you're not facing each other. You're not. There's no eye contact. But um, sometimes, for some people, eye contact can be intimidating. Um, so it's about discerning the culture and the subculture. Excellent, thank you. And also culture is a big piece. There are some cultures where uh, it's a sign of disrespect if a younger person looks an older person in the eyes. Okay, so that might be that, that may send a sign to you all that, what's this person doing? They're not listening to me. But in their culture, they're, they're taught that you don't look adults in the eyes. So. It's interesting to just pay attention to those types of things whenever you're listening and communicating with others. Did I see a hand back here? Yes. If it, you're more comfortable not looking at each other. Yes. Sort of like what Father Dwight was saying. You're both looking in the same direction. Yes. Yes. And I did this conversation or I did this uh, presentation once. And I said, you know, giving, giving the person, you know, your full communication or your full attention. And this person said, you know, some of, our, some of my daughters and my best talks are when we're preparing dinner together. So I quickly changed that around and said, communicate. You don't have to look them exactly in the eyes if you know that you're listening. And that's where maybe some of the uh-huhs or mm, tell me more is kind of come in. So everybody got that? Yes. I also think like sometimes like the closer you are to, a, are to a person like the less there's a need for eye contact like if you don't know someone very well it's like more polite but if you're like really close you're like close enough you don't need to actually look them in the eye to know they're listening wow great great um perspective i like that yeah absolutely so you already have that kind of relationship built up where you don't need to necessarily make eye contact they know you're listening okay great Great, great answers, great comments. Okay, so moving on to some things you can do while you're listening. 
to let other people let the other person know that you're listening, right? One of them is to ask open questions and probes. Okay, so open questions and probes are of course interventions that help to identify, to kind of clarify and explore thoughts or feelings. We have open questions and we have closed questions. Can anyone give me an example of a closed question? What's a closed question? Yes. Yes. See what happened there? Okay, so closed questions are generally one word answers to questions, okay? Is the sky blue? What color are your eyes? Whatever, okay? What we're looking to do when we're communicating, especially when we want, to, we want people to feel supported and encouraged, is to ask open questions. So using words like what or how, okay, can sometimes open the door to, act, to have more of an elaboration of, of the particular question. Does that make sense? Yeah? One of my favorite questions that I ask in therapy is, what's the worst that can happen? Okay, I deal with a lot of people who have anxiety issues, okay, and that anxiety, you're probably all familiar with anxiety, um, or at least know what it is. And asking a person who's anxious or worried about or nervous about doing something, the, the thing I'll ask them is, okay, let's explore what's the worst thing that can happen. It's a really, really powerful tool, not only to communicate, but also to have one, to have someone explore what's really inhibiting them from engaging in the behavior that you're talking about. Make sense? Why questions? Um, I can't remember who it was on the panel earlier today, but said to find out the whys, ask the whys, and how that is different from this kind of why question is, I can remember growing up and my dad, when I would do something wrong, which was frequent, my dad would ask me, why'd you do that? And my response would be, I have no idea. I don't know. And then his follow up to that would be, well, what do you mean you don't know? And then I would follow up with, I don't know. So <laughs> asking the why question can sometimes be off-putting, so just keep that in mind. You know, we're not talking, we're not minimizing the importance of getting the, the full context of what, what the other person's trying to say, but when you ask why, it could make people kind of feel on guard. So just keep that in mind, if you would. Okay. Restatement, a repeating or rephrasing of the content or meaning of yours, the other person's statements. Okay, so basically a restatement is, is taking what the other person said and repeating it back to them with fewer but similar words, okay? So this again, when you're listening, not only looking at the person and showing that you're listening and hearing them, but also these kind of responses to what they're saying, okay? So essentially what you're doing is you're, you're taking the information that they're giving to you and you're free, rephrasing it in a way that helps to make it more clear to them. Sometimes people will say things that um, it, it's not after, it's not until after it was restated back to them that they're like, did I just say that? So restating it back to them. So what you wanna do is you want someone to, under, to feel like they're being listened to or heard by restating it concisely back to them. Um, it's to clarify, focus, to support and encourage talk. Um, Oftentimes we're acting as a sounding board. And the biggest thing to this, I'll get to you in a second, um, is to watch for parenting, or parroting. Okay, what's parroting? Does anyone know? Anyone know what parroting is? Exactly, 100%, yep, 100%. Did everyone hear that? So it's, it, parroting is, essentially like that parrot that, that sits on the pirate's shoulder that says everything the parrot says, the person is saying something to you and then you say the exact same thing back to them. And then they say it again to you and you say again exactly the same message they sent to you. 
what a restatement is, is clearly and concisely taking their message and conveying it back to them to, to ensure, to show them that you, that, that you understand their message. Okay? Everybody understand that? Yeah? You probably do this all the time. This is just um, a name for it. You had a question or a comment? I think when you restate it back to the person, um, you could ask the person too more about why do they feel that way or to elaborate a little bit more because your perception of what they're saying could be different than what they're actually saying. Absolutely. And I heard you, you say one word there and it, you said how they're feeling. Did I hear you say that? Okay. Okay. So, without skipping ahead, here are some messages of restatements, or here are some examples. I hear you saying, and then fill in the blank, it sounds as if, or so, and then repeating kind of uh, what the message is, the main part of the message. But reflection of feelings. So this is a different skill. And we jumped ahead a little bit, but we're right on track. So, the reflection of feelings, it's repeating or rephrasing the other person's message or statements, and also uh, attaching a feeling to that particular statement. Okay, so as you can see, um, the examples are, it seems like you're feeling, or um, so you feel blah, this way because whatever. So it's, it's not only taking that message and rephrasing it back to them, but it's also assigning or attaching that feeling of how they must be feeling. Now, you also said something about misinterpreting. And you can, you can absolutely do that. I do it all the time in treatment. So I'll say to someone, wow, it must be really, um, you must be really sad whenever fill in the blank. And they'll say, eh, no, not really. I'm like, oh, okay, I was completely off on there. So you can make that mistake, absolutely. Um, you know, part of it has to do with your relationship, whether or not they, you know, forgive you, or if they're nice and say, oh, kind of. I'll have people in treatment all the time say, um, kind of, sort of, and they, I think we, they like me and I like them and they don't want to hurt my feelings, but basically if I'm wrong, hey, tell me I'm wrong. How are you really feeling? Yes. seems, uh, I've noticed this in some pastoral counseling that I've done, um, sometimes the reason, like I've had the same issue, like sometimes you restate something and all of a sudden they're like, no, that's not what I was, so what I've discovered is when the, the conversation starts at kind of a superficial level and sometimes the thing that they're talking about is not really what they're trying to open up about. And so when you restate it and they say, no, not really, then it's like, oh, so you, you, you may have restated it correctly, but that wasn't the real issue. It, it's a surface issue that they feel comfortable talking about that they're not really that interested in, but now you're inviting them to go something that they're really concerned about, not the surface issue. Yeah, and we say going deeper, yeah. going deeper. And, and that, you know, a lot of the part of going deeper really... Um, is, is about the relationship that you have. You know, talking about feelings is really, really um, personal. Um, so when you have a really good relationship with someone, you're inclined to be able to not have to look at them or, um, you know, don't have to worry about talking about feelings. If you meet a stranger on the street, you know, it, that might be a, a little bit of a different approach of really get into the feelings of, you know, how does it feel or whatever. So a lot of that, I believe, has to do with judging the relationship and where you are at that particular moment. Um, <clears throat> okay, so another way that we can, as we're reflecting feelings or utilizing this skill, is to really pay attention to not only looking the other person in the eyes, but also looking at the way that they're behaving. Okay, so someone, someone may say something like this. Uh, I feel really angry when fill in the blank. Okay, and a restatement can say, or a reflection of feelings may sound like this. Oh, so when fill in the blank happens, you really get frustrated, don't you? Or it really irritates you. 
Okay, so I use a different word, but they specifically mm. express to me their feeling. Okay, what about the times where the person doesn't necessarily say the feeling? Okay, so that's where you run the risk of either misjudging the feeling, um, or or um, you know just be, being wrong, really. Or you can nail it, of course. But part of it can also a give you a clue of watching p other people's body languages and the way that they're behaving, okay? Uh, oftentimes, I, I just met with an adolescent the other day who the whole time sat with his legs crossed, his arms crossed like this, and tapped his foot the entire time. Um, that would send a message to me that he feels really, really guarded and vulnerable, okay? So that's a way that we can talk a little bit about that. Now, when I said that to him, he denied it. He said, oh, I feel great. I'm really open to new things. But I think I was right. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions about reflection, reflecting feelings? So it's essentially taking the message and then attaching a feeling to, to that as you reflect it back to the other person. Okay, self-disclosure. Okay, so... Again, disclosing something personal that draws a parallel to something that is currently going on with the person uh, with whom you're communicating, okay? Uh, what this can do is kind of the misery loves company kind of feeling where, um, you know, knowing that someone else has gone through a similar situation uh, oftentimes normalizes it. It's called normalizing it. Um, it helps people not feel like they're alone, okay? So disclosing, self-disclosing. You have to be careful with this. Um, you know, one of the things that I do when I'm communicating with other people is I will ask myself, why am I disclosing this? Am I disclosing this piece of information about myself for me, or am I disclosing it for the other person with whom I'm communicating? And if the answer is yes to number two, then I'll disclose it. But if it's, no, you just want them to know whatever, then I usually sit on that for a while. Okay? Any questions? I feel like I'm doing all the talking. Questions? No? Comments? Okay. Um, one really powerful way of communicating is to not say anything. Not say anything at all. To use silence. I think we're, at least I, had to get really, really, really a lot better at sitting with, we call it sitting with silence. Um, sometimes that's uncomfortable for people. Have you ever done that? Have you ever communicated with someone where, you know, th this kind of, you didn't want any silence in the room at all because it was so, you know, discomforting? Did anyone ever do that? Am I the only one that suffered from this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes it can be uncomfortable but sometimes it can be incredibly powerful um, where it gives the other person um, the ability to really gain insight. Okay, they might be thinking about things. You know, a lot of things can happen during that small period of silence. Yes? I, th I don't want to do all the talking either, but uh, I always have, that's always an issue for me. Um, but yeah, what I've noticed, uh, the value of silence especially is when you're able to discern um, that a question that the person you're talking to says, verbalizes, and says, what am I supposed to do? And, and like, you're ready to come in. And it, it doesn't sound rhetorical, but they're not really looking for you to answer it. And that's where the silence can come in. Like, the, the silent response is the best when, you know, if it's a question that, they're asking verbally, but they don't really want you to answer. That makes sense. But that takes a while to figure out what that is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. And it was Lori who said earlier um, that when she was communicating with her daughter about an issue, um, she just listened. She just listened. She wasn't Mrs. Fix-It person. She was just there to listen. And I would think that there were probably times during that conversation that you just sat in silence and allowed your daughter to communicate with you. Sometimes that's just all we, we need. Okay? 
Any questions before we move on? Which, okay. I'm going to kind of skip over this next part because we have until what, two? Do I have to finish a couple more minutes before two? Uh, you have until five. Five to two. Okay. So what I'd like to do is poll the adolescents. This part's fascinating. Rather than me do my PowerPoint stuff, I'd like to hear what you feel you need when you're communicating with your parents. This is the down and dirty. We're getting it from adolescent experts. They are, they are expert adolescents right here at this table. Are there parents here? Okay. So if you feel comfortable, if you feel comfortable, that's right, parents have to go this way. If you feel comfortable, what is it when you're communicating that you want? What do you, what do you, need, what do you feel you need? Or what don't you feel that you want? Okay. Well, I feel like it depends on the time and like it's like kind of like a case by case thing cuz like sometimes you need like advice for something and like you need them to like talk back but other times you just need like to to like just to like say something and just <laughs> you need someone to listen. And so you just need that person like sitting there like nodding their head being like it's all going to be okay, but then there's other times where it's like you actually need the advice because you're confused. Mm. Okay. So piggyback. To piggyback on that, how do your parents know that? Do you have a sign or a card that you hold up and say, just advice, please? No, but that's a good idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Excellent. There you go. A so, so hold, sign holding. Nice, nice. But it is. I mean, think about it, though. How, how would they know? How would they know? How would they know what you're really looking for? What do you think you can do? Um, I feel like it's a lot of, like, reading the person when you're talking to them. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if they're coming up and, like, I guess, like, partially, like, body language and just, like, what the situation is. Because it's definitely, like, a case-by-case -case kind of thing. It is. So like if they come up and they're like crying or something like that and they're just like keep on like talking and stuff like like you might just need to like be the person to like sit there and pat them on the back. <laughs> but, um, but other times if it's more like in like if I'm like asking a question or something then it's definitely a situation where like you want feedback. Okay. So based on a, a lot of it has to do with what you're telling them, the other person, your parents for instance. Okay, so, um, you know, I really need your advice on this. Yeah. can be a really good segue into knowing that this is the, this, the, the, the context of this meeting is going to be about you giving me advice, but maybe not prepping that. Maybe if you become tearful or something like that, it might be just shut up and listen to me. And then if that doesn't work, go to the sign. Yeah, just work with the signs. Work with the signs, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Um, so this might be like a little bit of me just growing up and being 18, like, oh, I voted already and all that stuff. But um, sometimes I just need my parents to um, s switch gears almost and kind of, because I know what, if I tell them something, I can usually tell you what they would say back as a parent. But I don't know sometimes like what they would say as themselves, because I know that um, my parents, my dad and my mom, especially my dad, as I've gotten close to him as I've grown older, that like sometimes the dad that he puts on is um, not different, but you know, like the reaction would be different than if like he was talking to someone else, you mm. know, other than his daughters. So um, I think sometimes I need to, to take that off and just like listen to me as a, as a person, not as the daughter. Does that make sense? A hundred percent, yes. I think that is, that is really a powerful statement. Um, and, and difficult for parents if I have some copies of PowerPoints up here that you're welcome to take home because this kind of moved around a little bit. One of the pieces I do put in here is, is parental self-care. I think that parents put a lot of pressure on themselves to do the right things. Of course, modeling is a huge way of teaching. Um, 
you know, modeling our values that we talk about. Not just talking about our morals and values and our faith, but modeling them, okay? Uh, I think there's a responsibility that we have as parents, like, hey, we really need to, you know, always do the right thing all the time um, or we're going to mess up our kids. And, and actually, the last thing in my PowerPoint is that if you're a perfect parent, you'd really mess up your kids. So just keep that in mind, you parents. But nevertheless, I think that's in line with maybe why you feel like your dad is kind of you know, having that role of dad. I'm certain that he loves you and just wants to be there and give you the best that he can as your father, for sure. But thank you for that. That was really, really insightful. Yours was too. I love the card. Idea. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I think that part of it, kind of like going off of that whole talking to someone like as a person, not just as a parent. Um, I think a big part of the reason that we're willing to talk to our friends about a problem before our parents is because, like, I know for me, the most frustrating thing is when you try to open up to your parents and they bring their expectations into it. That's terrible. <laughs> Tell me you know more. what I mean? Like when you're talking to somebody. <laughs> um, Is that um, a typical counselor response? Yeah. It Tell is. me more. It really, it, it's okay <laughs> though. Um, um, Sorry, it's a voice of habit. <laughs> but like part of it is like if you're talking to somebody and they give you like the eyebrow raise or the furrowed eyebrows and they're like, oh, like you really, that's really what you think? Like, yeah, yeah, that is what I think. Mean. Like, um, I think that parents really struggle with separating who they want you to be and what their expectations are from the actual situation and giving like human advice instead of turning it into a scolding. That's important, I think. Wow. Sorry, was that too much? That was awesome. That was awesome. Who can comment on that? Because I am, that we, I'd like to stick with this for just a couple minutes. Talk, talk about that. Who can comment on that? Father Dwight, I have not heard from you today. <laughs> I got it. Somebody's got to shut me up. Who wants to do it here? One of my parishioners has to do it. Hey, Sean Frank will do it. You want to talk? Uh, okay. We're coming back to you. Um, I remember when uh, I got in trouble one time for uh, I started tobacco use, and my parents really got mad about that. But the first time I sat down with my dad about it, he would uh, he talked to me about it and why I did it. Uh, I got yelled at by my mom for it, but my dad was the only one who kind of understood. So. Thank you so much for sharing. I know that's that's personal information, and I, and I really appreciate you having the courage to share that. Um, different responses from two different parents, right? Who did you feel more supportive by? Mom who maybe flow off the handle, or dad who at least had an understanding? My dad. Your dad. Isn't that interesting? Interesting how that works. But yes, now I'm certain that your dad didn't say, you know what, tobacco use, it's fantastic. I'm glad you started, Frank. Um, <laughs> you know, I'd like for you to double up and really get into this addiction thing, right? He didn't do that. No. Okay. So he gave you information about it, probably, how it's harmful for you. You still struggle with it, absolutely. But he wasn't saying, it's okay, buddy. Hey, you know, he was giving you advice, but he was doing it in a way that was um, supportive. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, excellent. Thank you again. And you started this back there, by the way. Excellent. Uh, yes. I do have, uh, I just want to root this portion of what we're talking about, uh, where the, the parent has the ideal child and the real child and they're trying to bridge that gap. Um, that is the, the whole thing of the parent being able to empathize with the child is rooted in our theology. As, and I would just, I don't think this is ever talked about, but um, we, there's a thing called Pelagianism, which is that we can work our way to heaven and that it's up to you to get your kids to heaven, which is true to a certain degree, but it becomes this, this impossible standard for people, and the, the, the emphasis on the free will and the dignity and the individuality of the person is being forgotten, and that's where we get into trouble, because then it just becomes rebellion against the parents 
it's really helpful when your parent um, doesn't yell at you. I remember, I do remember when I got in trouble in high school, which I've never mentioned before, but, uh, <laughs> which is a lie. Um, I got in trouble and I was in major, major trouble, 10 demerits, 10 hours of detention and everything. And I do remember my dad's response and my mom's response was, because they knew I was already being scolded by the school and they just were very calm about it and said, you know, they didn't say, yeah, you did a good job, but they were, I still remember my dad and I at the door and I was going out to the bus and he just was asking me how I was doing and he knew what had happened, but he didn't fly off the handle at all. He just was understanding. And I think it's coming because like, he remembers getting in trouble in school. He remembers this, he, you know, and he identified with, you know, like he knew he was no angel. Um, and he was willing to communicate that and say, yes, I fell into these problems, but now my faith, you know, so the faith came in there, um, but it wasn't the first thing. It wasn't like, it was like, you know what? I know where you're coming from, you know, and you know, we're all human. And, um, but I never, for getting in trouble in school, I never got yelled at by my dad, which was amazing. Yeah. But it's, again, it's rooted in our theology because of the, the dignity of the human person and that the person has a free will and that ultimately the parents can't control the destiny or the choices of the child. It's impossible. We're not created that way. We're not supposed to, we're not supposed to put that level of expectation on ourselves. So. Thank you very much for sharing. Yes. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Caitlin. I get the impression Caitlin comes from a communicative family. They probably, you know, you're comfortable talking. And what, what about a family of quiet people? You know, whether it's the children who are quiet or it's the mom and dad. So maybe, like, you teenagers, you, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, I, my parents aren't really all that talkative. How do I talk to them? How do I express myself? I, I mean... You're asking... I, I'm... I'm putting that as a general to the whole group. Because I think that there probably, there probably are situations where it's like, oh, I can't, I can barely get a word out of my mother, or vice versa, the mom feels that the children, the, you know, the adolescent children are just not expressing themselves. Like maybe you could give advice or we could give advice to each other. Sometimes it can be like, maybe I have to write my mom a note instead of, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying because yeah. not everybody in the room, I'm sure, comes from a really chatty family. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Emory. I have some suggestions, but let's let's hear from you folks. Oh, just okay. talking about the thing, talking about the thing with the like the quiet family. So like my mom, she she's always working, and my sister is always gone, and my dad is in another country. They're not divorced. It, that's just how it is, and. We do live in a quiet family, and they used to worry because, like, we never really talk to each other. We don't have, like, the family bonding things. But then you do come across those moments where you guys are just, you start talking to each other, and it just lasts for hours and hours. And it just feels a lot more, like, reassuring to talk to your parents, rather not as parents, but as, like, friends. Like, not, like, your best friends, ones you get in trouble with, but, like, the ones who, like, <laughs> the ones who, like, would give you advice, who's just, like... Yeah, I've gone through that once, too. It's like, yeah, I went to a party. I actually did something. It's like, eh. well, like, it's just, they're not parents anymore. They're like, they're your friends, but they're still your parents. And in quiet families, that's a lot harder to do because no one really talks. So you just kind of have to, like, it's like meeting a new person. You just need to find an icebreaker. Just be like, so did you hear about that new movie? And then it's like, and then it'll go on from there. And generally, you'll, you'll start talking more and more, and that's just how it works. Wonderful, wonderful. I love that. So finding an icebreaker, I heard. That's an excellent, excellent way. And did anyone else have anything to offer? Um, finding, I heard finding. You talked about writing a note. So what I would suggest is finding any way in which you can communicate your feelings to another person in the family. Some people communicate better with a written word. Um, my wife's family was a lot like that. 
uh, where they, they wrote letters and, and still kind of do. They'll write letters rather than talking about how they feel. They'll write letters about how they feel. And that works for them. That, that does it for them. I'm too lazy to write letters, so <laughs> it's easier for me to talk. Um, so that works for me. But, you know, blend it. If, if the other person needs to see the written word, then, you know, finding finding that way, coming up with an icebreaker or working, finding the way that works, I would say is the best way to do it. Sometimes it's email, sometimes it's text, sometimes it's letter writing, whatever. Um, but I think that that's a great question for sure. Okay, anybody else have any questions or concerns? Because uh, Gabriel said I have two minutes about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, I will... Again, there are PowerPoints of this for those of you that want to read it right before you go to bed to fall asleep. Um, and here's my contact information. I know we kind of went through this rather quickly, but if there's anything, uh, if you had any questions, my email's here. Take a packet, and there's some le uh, literature as well. Take a packet, and then you can email me or call whatever. Um, and we'll go from there. So thank you so much for having me. I hope this was beneficial for you. On the back part of the uh, program here. Thank you very much. Uh, you're a great communicator. <laughs> I, I hope uh, we've all learned uh, how to communicate not only with our, our children, grandchildren, but also with the larger community as a result of today's activities. I want to thank everybody for coming, and especially two Canadian people who are here. Please raise your hand. Uh, from, what, what are your name, Marion? Maria from Sarnia, Ontario, north of Detroit on Lake Huron. So, I think we have succeeded. We've become international today. <laughs> so, again, thank you for coming, and you will be hearing from us. So, thank you.